Welcome to the 2017 Carol Spaziani Intellectual Freedom Festival here at the Iowa City Public Library. We are very happy to have for, I don't know how many years it's been, fifth year reading aloud from the Johnson County Iowa City Senior Center to come and, and speak with us today. In October of 1963, President Kennedy said, when power corrupts, poetry cleanses. In this time where we have leaders who suspect the arts and thus cut their funding, who have a distaste for a free and open press, and who have a fluid and transforming use of false information and call it truth, poetry is an art form that can't be challenged. After all, poetry is the cleansing of one's thoughts, soul, and essence, and it can't be contradicted, criticized, or denied. Today, Reading Aloud is presenting a program on political poetry. Listen and learn and realize that it's an ongoing force that will survive even this time. So I'll give it to Ina. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it has been a privilege for Reading Aloud to have read at this Intellectual Freedom Festival. This is the fifth time. The first year we read poets whose work had been banned or challenged. The second year, poems by Edgar Allan Poe. The third year, poems of protest, which were mainly about racial injustice. Last year, erotic love poems. And this year, political poems. I think we still keep finding things to make these programs about. Um, You'll, and the, the poems, I think, speak for themselves, but you'll notice that the year of publication or, or, or writing appears, and so you'll see that they were written at many different times and in some different places, which tell us perhaps that those issues are universal and eternal, and I hope that you do enjoy them. Now, usually at this point, I introduce the members of Reading Aloud, but this time we're doing something a little different, and we will all introduce ourselves at a point in the program and then go on with the program. So that is something a little different, and I hope that you appreciate it. Um, the last thing is please hold your applause until the end of the program, and now we'll simply get started. Thank you. The Unknown Citizen by W.H. Auden, written in 1939. He was found by the Bureau of Statistics to be one against whom there was no official complaint. And all the reports on his conduct agree that in the modern sense of an old-fashioned word, he was a saint. For in everything he did, he served the greater community, except for the war, till the day he retired, he worked in a factory and never got fired, but satisfied his employer's Fudge Motors, Inc. Yet he wasn't a scab or odd in his views, for his union reports that he paid his dues. Our report on his union shows it was sound. And our social psychology workers found that he was popular with his mates and liked a drink. The press are convinced that he bought a paper every day and that his reactions to advertisements were normal in every way. Policies taken out in his name prove that he was fully insured, and his health card shows he was once in a hospital but left it cured. Both producers' research and high-grade living declare he was fully sensible to the advantages of the installment plan and had everything necessary to the modern man, a phonograph, a radio, a car, and a frigid air. Our researchers into public opinion are content that he held the proper opinions for the time of year. When there was peace, he was for peace. When there was war, he went. He was married and added five children to the population, which our eugenist says was the right number for a parent of his generation. And our teachers report that he never interfered with their education. Was he free? Was he happy? The question is absurd. Had anything been wrong, we should certainly have heard.
Manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front by Wendell Berry, written 1967. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die, and you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So friends, every day, do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all you cannot understand. Praise ignorance, for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium, plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in, two in, in the two inches of hum humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields. Lie easy in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Swear allegiance to what is nighest your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. The Human Abstract, a poem written by William Blake in 1789. <clears throat> Pity would be no more if we did not make somebody poor, and mercy no more could be if all were happy as we. And mutual fear brings peace till the selfish loves increase, then cruelty knits a snare and spreads his baits with care. He sits down with holy fears and waters the ground with tears. Then humility takes its root underneath his foot, soon spreads to dismal shade of mystery over his head, and caterpillar and fly feed on the mystery, and it bears the fruit of deceit, ruddy and sweet to eat. And the raven his nest has made in its thickest shade. The gods of earth and sea sought through nature to find this tree. But their search was all in vain. There grows one in the human brain.
You Who Wronged by Shesla Milosh, written in 1950. You who wronged a simple man bursting into laughter at the crime and kept a pack of fools around you to mix good and evil, to blur the line. Though everyone bowed down before you, saying virtue and wisdom lit your way, striking gold medals in your honor, glad to have survived another day. Do not feel safe, the poet remembers. You can kill one, but another is born. The words are written down, the deed, the date. And you'd have done better with a winter dawn, a rope, and a branch bowed beneath your weight. Hatred by Vyshlava Chimborska, written in 1993. See how efficient it is, still is, how it keeps itself in shape. Our century's hatred, how easily it vaults the tallest obstacles, how rapidly it pounces, tracks us down. It's not like other feelings, it wants both older and younger, gives birth itself to the reasons that give it life. When it sleeps, it's never eternal rest. And sleeplessness won't sap its strength, it feeds it. One religion or another, whatever gets it ready, in position one father love, or fatherland or another, whatever helps it get a running start. Justice also works well at the outset until hate gets its own momentum going. Hatred, hatred, its face twisted in a grimace of erotic ecstasy. Oh, these other feelings, listless weaklings. Since when does brotherhood draw crowds? Has compassion ever finished first? Does doubt ever really rouse the rabble? Only hatred has just what it takes. Gifted, diligent, hardworking, need we mention all the songs it's composed, all the pages it has added to our history books, all the human carpets it has spread over countless city squares and football fields. Let's face it, it knows how to make beauty. The splendid fire glow in midnight skies, magnificent bursting bombs in rosy dawns, you can't deny the inspiring pathos of ruins and a certain body humor to be found in the sturdy column jutting from their midst. Hatred is a master of contrast between explosion and dead quiet, red blood and white snow. Above all, it never tires of its leitmotif the impeccable executioner towering over its soiled victim. It's always ready for new challenges. If it has to wait a while, it will. They say it's blind. Blind? It has a sniper's keen sight and gazes unflinchingly at the future as only it can.
Some People by Wisława Zimborska, written in 1993. Some people fleeing some other people in some country under the sun and some clouds. They leave behind some of their everything, sown fields, some chickens, dogs, mirrors in which fire now sees itself reflected. On their backs are pitchers and bundles, the emptier, the heavier from one day to the next. Taking place stealthily is somebody's stopping, and in the commotion, somebody's bread, somebody's snatching, and a dead child, somebody's shaking. In front of them, some still not the right way, nor the bridge that should be over a river strangely rosy. Around them, some gunfire, at times closer, at times farther off, and above, a plain circling somewhat. Some invisibility would come in handy, some grayish stoniness, or even better, non-being for a little or a long while. Something else is yet to happen, only where and what. Someone will head toward them, only when and who, in how many shapes and with what intentions. Given a choice, maybe he will choose not to be the enemy and leave them with some kind of life. Ordinance on a Rifle by Naomi LaSalle, written in 1989. Welcome to you who have managed to get here. It's been a terrible trip. You should be happy you have survived it. Statistics prove that not many do. You would like a bath, a hot meal, a good night's sleep. Some of you need medical attention. None of this is available. These things have always been in short supply. Now they are impossible to obtain. This is not a temporary situation. It is permanent. Our condolences on your disappointment. It is not our responsibility. Everything you have heard about this place is false. It is not our fault. You have been deceived. Ruin your health getting here for reasons beyond our control. There's no vehicle out. Lady Freedom Among Us by Rita Dove, written in 1999. Don't lower your eyes or stare straight ahead to where you think you ought to be going. Don't mutter, oh no, not another one. Get a job, fly a kite, go bury a bone. With her old fashioned sandals, with her leaden skirts, with her stained cheeks and whiskers and heaped up trinkets, she has, given, she has risen among us in blunt reproach. She has fitted her hair under a hand-me-down cap and spruced it up 
with feathers and stars. Slung over her shoulder, she bears the rainbowed layers of charity and murmurs, all of you, even the least of you, don't cross to the other side of the square. Don't think of another item to fit on the tourist agenda. Consider her drenched gaze, her shining brow. She has brought mercy back into the streets and will not retire politely to the potter's field. Having assumed the thick skin of this town, its gridded exhaust, its sun scorch and blear, she rests in her weathered plumage, big boned resident. Don't you can ever forget her. Don't even try. She's not going to budge. No choice but to grant her space, crown her with sky, for she is one of the many, and she is each of us. The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, 1883. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Immigration Anthem by Sharon Olds written in 2017. I bring you a tired song of my poor femur knob aching before the hip hop. I huddled this morning under the covers. The leg weighs twice as much as the other leg by now. I swing its masses of fluid along like an enclosed falls. My mother told me that her people had come here from across the sea, yearning to sing to their god of crags and thistles to breathe free men and women who made war naked, painted blue, attacked by their landlords who saw them as wretched refuse, garbage teeming with vermin. They had pushed off from that shore and floated homeless on the ocean through calm and tempest, sometimes in sight of a fountain tossed up out of the brow of one whose house was the water was, until they came to these islands and low hills, which lift up from a land where we have set a lamp with a golden torch on top, to remind us here at the door, entering through it, it was a promise to leave it open behind us. Now, if the readers would like to come forward for the introductions. My name is Carrie Malone. I'm the granddaughter of an immigrant. My name is Kathy Mitchell, and I am the granddaughter and niece of immigrants. My name is Johnny Ellsworth. I am the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of immigrants. My name is Ida Lohenberg. I am the wife of an immigrant the niece of immigrants and the granddaughter of immigrants. 
I am Michael Chan. I have been an immigrant for 48 years. I'm Nancy Lynch, and I am a descendant of immigrants. I'm Betty Norbeck, and I am the sister-in-law of an immigrant and the granddaughter of immigrants. My name is Mary Wallace Gutman. I am a descendant of immigrants, down to my mother who came from Canada, and the wife of a second generation immigrant. My name is Jim Piper, and I'm fairly certain I'm descended of immigrants. I'm Chuck Felling, and I'm the great grandson of immigrants. I'm Jim Curry, I'm a grandson of an immigrant and son in law of an immigrant. Or by Thomas Sayers Ellis, 2006. Or, or Oreo, or worse, or ordinary, or your choice of category, or color, or any color other than colored, or colored only, or of color, or other, or theory of discourse, or Oral Territory, Oregon, or Georgia, or Florida Zora, or Opportunity, or Born Poor, or Corporate, or Moore, or a Noir Orpheus, or Senghor, or Diaspora, or a horrendous and tore up journey, or performance, or allegory's armor of ignorant comfort, or worship, or reform, or a sore chorus, or electoral corruption, or important ports of Yoruba, or worry, or neighbor, or fear of, of terror, or border, or all organized minorities. The poem about Stalin by Osip Mandelstam, written in 1934. We live in a land with no ground beneath our feet. We whisper whatever we say whenever we meet. In each pause in a conversation, we think of who governs the nation. His fingers are slimy as worms and greasy and fat. His words are solid as rocks and they knock you flat. He has snickering cockroach whiskers and he never gets shit on his shoes. His gang is a gaggle of no neck monsters and crooks. They shake in their boots. They're all afraid of his looks. They say da, they never say niet, but he goes bang and they sweat. He tosses his orders like horseshoes over the Kremlin walls. We get hit in the face, in the back, in the butt, in the balls. And every time someone gets murdered, he sticks out his chest for a medal. Uh, 
I paint what I see, a ballad of artistic integrity, written by E.B. White in 1933. What do you paint when you paint a wall, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson. Do you paint just anything there at all? Will there be any doves or a tree in fall or a hunting scene like an English hall? I paint what I see, said Rivera. What are the colors you use when you paint, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson. Do you use any red in the beard of a saint? If you do, is it terribly red or faint? Do you use any blue? Is it Prussian? I paint what I paint, said Rivera. Whose head is that I see on my wall, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson. Is it anyone's head whom we know at all? A Rensselaer, a Saltonstall? Is it Franklin D? Is it Mordant Hall? Or is it the head of a Russian? I paint what I think, said Rivera. I paint what I paint. I paint what I see. I paint what I think, said Rivera. And the thing that is dearest in life to me in a bourgeois hall is integrity. However, I'll take out a couple of people drinking and put in a picture of Abraham Lincoln. I could even give you McCormick's Reaper and still not make my art much cheaper. But the head of linen has got to stay, or my friends will give me the bird today, the bird, the bird forever. It's not good taste in a man like me, said John Dee's grandson, Nelson, to question an artist's integrity or to mention a practical thing like a fee. But I know what I like to a large degree. Though art, I hate to tamp hamper for 21,000 conservative bucks. You painted a radical. I say shucks. I never could rent the offices the capitalistic offices, for this, as you know, is a public hall, and people want doves or a tree in fall. And though your art I dislike to hamper, I owe a little to God and Gramper. And after all, it's my wall. We'll see if it is, said Rivera. It is dangerous to read newspapers, written by Margaret Atwood in 1968. When I was building neat castles in the sandbox, the hasty pits were filling with bulldozed corpses. And as I walked to the school, washed and combed, my feet stepping on cracks in the cement detonated red bombs. Now I am grown up and literate and I sit in my chair as quietly as a fuse. And the jungles are flaming. The underbrush is charged with soldiers. The names on the difficult maps go up in smoke. I am the cause. I am a stockpile of chemical toys. My body is a deadly gadget. I reach out in love. My hands are guns. My good intentions are completely lethal. Even my passive eyes transmute everything I look at to the pocked black and white of a war photo. How can I stop myself? It is dangerous to read newspapers. Each time I hit a key on my electric typewriter, speaking of peaceful trees, another village explodes.
late. Mm -hmm. Of Late by George Starbuck, written in 1966. Stephen Smith, University of Iowa sophomore, burned what he said was his draft card. And Norman Morrison, Quaker of Baltimore, Maryland, burned what he said was himself. You, Robert McNamara, burned what you said was a concentration of the enemy aggressor. No news medium troubled to put it in quotes. And Norman Morrison, Quaker of Baltimore, Maryland, burned what he said was himself. He said it was simple materials, such as would be found in your kitchen. In your office, you were informed. Reporters got cracking frantically on the mental disturbance angle. So far, nothing turns up. Norman Morrison, Quaker of Baltimore, Maryland, burned, and while burning, screamed. No tip off, no release. Nothing to quote, to manage to put in quotes. Pity the unaccustomed hesitance of the newspaper editorialists. Pity the press photographers not called. Norman Morrison, Quaker, of Baltimore, Maryland, burned and was burned and said all that there is to say in that language, twice what is said in yours. It is a strange sect, Mr. McNamara, under advice to try the whole of a thought in silence and to oneself. On the steps of the Jefferson Memorial, my Linda passed down, written in 2007. <clears throat> we invent our gods the way the Greeks did, in our own image, but magnified. Athena, the very mother of wisdom, squabbled with Poseidon like any human sibling until their furious tempers made the sea writhe. Zeus wore a crown of lightning bolts one minute a cloak of flat feathers the next, as driven by earthly lust, he prepared to swoop down on Leda. Despite their power, frailty ran through them like the darker veins in the marble of these temples we call monuments. Looking at Jefferson now, I think of the language he left for us to live by. I think of the slave in the kitchen downstairs. The Elephant in the Room by Kay Ryan, 2017. The room is almost all elephant. Almost none of it isn't. Pretty much solid elephant. So there's no room to talk about it. New Year by Joanna Klink, written 2017. We woke to the darkness before our eyes, unable to take the measure of the loss. Who are they? What are we? What have we abandoned to arrive with such violence at this hour? In answer, we drew back, covered our ears with our hands, to the heedless victory, or vowed as I did into the changed air, never to consent. But it was already too late. Too late for the unfarmed fields, the men by the station, the park swings, the parking lots, the groundwater, the doves, 
too late for dusk falling in summer, chains of glass lakes mingled into dawn, the corals, the neighbors, the first drizzle on an empty street, cafeterias and stockyards, young men asking twice a day for work, too late for hope too far along to meet a country, a people, its annihilating need. Because the year is new and the great change already underway, we concede a thousandfold and feel harder than the land itself, a complicity for everything we did not see or comprehend. Cynicism born of raw despair, long cultivated hatreds, the promises of leaders traveling like cool silence through the dark. My life is here in this small room and like you, I am waiting to know, but there is no time to wait for what has happened. What does the future ask of me? Those who won't have enough to eat by evening, those whose disease will now take hold and the decades that carry past me once I've died, generations of children, the suffering that is never solved, the heat over the earth, its marshes, its crowded towers, its unbreathable night air. I would open my hand from the wrist, step outside, not lose nerve. Here is the day still to be lived. We do not fully know what to, we do, but the trains depart, the stations, traffic, lurches, and stalls. A highway crew has paused. Desert sun softens the first color of the rock. Who governs now governs by grievance and old scores. But we compass our worth, prepare to do the work not our own, and feel past the scorn in his eyes the burden in the torso of a stranger. Draw close to the sick, the weak, the women without jobs, the 12 year old facing spite half tangled into sleep, the panic tightening inside everyone who's been told to go. I will help you, although I do not know you, and strive not to look away. Be unwilling to profit and ache inside that endless effort. A slow down summons, not from those whose rage is lit by greed. We do not consent. But the ones who wake without prospect, those who don't speak, cannot recover, like the old woman at the counter, the helpless father who, like you, gets more, no more than this one life. Believe, Believe by Bob Kaufman, written in 1996. Believe in this, young apple seeds, in blue skies, radiating young breast, not in blue-suited insects, infesting society's garments. Believe in the swinging sounds of jazz, tearing the night into intricate shreds, putting it back together again, in cool, logical patterns, not in the sick controllers who created only the bomb. Let the voices of dead poets ring louder in your ears than the screechings mouthed in mildewed editorials. Listen to the music of centuries rising above the mushroom time. Battle Hymn of the Republic 
by Julia Ward Howe, written in 1861. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trembling out the vintage where the grapes of Rav are stored. He have loosed the fatal lightning of his terrible sweet soul. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built him an altar in the evening dews and dams. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I have read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As you deal with my contemptness, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. He has sung the fourth the trumpet that shall never call retreat is shifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him, be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom then transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us die to make men free while god is marching on Let America Be America Again, by Langston Hughes, written in 1935. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream, the dreamer's dream. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants skim. Let any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreaths. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There never has been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the sky? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the emigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean. Hungry yet today despite the dream, 
beaten yet today, O oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a surf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home, for I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lea and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today the millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? For all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me a, any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster deaths, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. Back to the top.